Hi, welcome to Community Talks. My name is Ann Ayers. I have the honor and privilege of being the Dean of the Colorado Women's College and also of being the co-lead of this incredible initiative called Community Plus Values, um, which has really been a very heart-led initiative uh, over the course of the last about year and a half um, at the University of Denver. And what we've been taking a look at is what's our culture like and how do we make it even better and how do we provide a sense of belonging for everyone? So um, I can't think of anybody better to speak about that really than alums, <laughs> because I think you've both been here and experienced uh, the University of Denver, but you've also been in other situations and you can kind of continue to lend your wisdom back to your alma mater. So it's a really special opportunity to hear from you all because you do have that um, on-campus and on -camp off-campus perspective. So thank you for being here. Um, and I'm so excited to see um, Neta Kikia here. And I, we, uh, she is a pro uh, program manager for DU Dialogues. Um, just a, a really fun person to, um, to engage with. Uh, this is the second or maybe third time you've done these for us. Um, so it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. She and I are gonna make an appointment to talk about um, Istanbul um, pretty soon because, because that's important. Uh, and I've spent some time there and it looks like you've lived and studied there. So, uh, so I think that's really extraordinary. Um, I think today, you know, we just have so much going on. Uh, Gosh, on campus, we've had some really big announcements um, and we've had some layoffs and some cuts. We've had uh, a lot going on um, in, the, in the external world too. Uh, and so much so that it's, it renders me speechless. That doesn't happen a lot. Um, but what I wanna say is that I know for me, what makes a difference is when I get to um, share my story and when I get to hear other people's stories. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to sitting back and listening uh, Netta is going to, going to, uh, introduce our panel and also, um, drive this dialogue, which is what you do professionally. So, <laughs> um, I think you're the right person and I'll come in, you know, five minutes to go and tell you a little bit about a very special guest that we're going to have on community talks next week that will, um, really knock your socks off. It's going to be fun, but I'm looking forward to sitting back listening and I'm going to give you my hardest questions in the Q and A. So I hope that the rest of you will join me and really, um, really just kind of making the most of the expertise we have in front of us. So thanks so much. And um, Netta, take it away, get started. Absolutely, thank you so much um, for having us back and cheers to the panel. I was just chatting with some folks earlier today as well as the panel, and this truly is an incredible lineup of people. So I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say and kind of dive into it. So um, a first few things that I just wanna mention um, to kind of ground us and also to, to name kind of some intentions and dynamics for the quick hour that we'll have together is that um, this is part of an ongoing series, like Anne was saying, and um, like a lot of you, I recognize a lot of the names from, <laughs> from folks who are attending. So good to see you all again. Um, but just wanna name that again, this is an ongoing series and it's not the first of the conversations because already we've heard from faculty, staff, we've heard from a few students, but like Anne said, to be able to hear from alum is truly an honor. And also the fact that they're all joining for us from all parts of the country is also really, really powerful. So. Um, just want to name that. And in addition to that, I want to say that um, I actually know a number of these folks from, from different spaces, whether that be from our time at DU or Connections to Connections. So it's neat to be able to join this conversation as a staff member, but also as an alumna who um, is really just excited to be here with others who've experienced quite a few things at the university. So um, one of the biggest things is that we tell our alum and all of these people know this very well because they would do it anyway, which is that speaking honestly from their experiences is a huge part of why we're here today, knowing that we'll have the good and we'll have the bad um, and that at the end of the day, we really do believe that DU can and should do better. And that the purpose is to talk about how to work toward making things better. So the last piece that I'll kind of end on is that uh, we ask all people on the call that um, are here to learn from each other's experiences and stories, the good, the bad, the in-between, the unnameable, the sometimes really hard to even talk about. So um, we encourage all folks to lean into that conversation and to show up exactly the way that you would. So just want to say cheers to the collective and cheers to specifically our panel today. And uh, we'll try to cover as many of our questions as possible. So um, just to know up front for all folks is that I've already told our panel that I'm one of my tasks in this role is to keep the conversation moving. So I will not talk as much <laughs> moving forward, but instead might interrupt if needed to keep the conversation going. So 
Um, we have a few ways that we could do this. The, all of our panelists have incredible bios. So maybe what we could do is, um, I don't want to necessarily read them because I feel like you all can do quite the justifying. Like you can just explain your own stuff. But I think if, it, if folks are willing, like what I can do is drop the um, bios into the chat for people to read as you're kind of introducing yourself. So our first um, kind of question is to start us off, um, just tell us a little bit more to get to know you all um, and to situate us in this space. So um, we know it's a loaded question, but one of the questions that I have for you all and that we have for you all is just wanting to check in and say, how are you doing? Um, and so that is a loaded question. So answer that however you feel relevant and maybe give us a little bit of the things that you feel are most relevant to introduce about yourself. And then um, from there, I'll just drop your full bio into the chat so folks can read it. So um, with this, I usually just start in alphabetical order. So I think that is Arielle. <laughs> Who's this say for me? Amazing. And that never actually happens because my last name begins with the Z, so I'm almost always at the end. So this is quite fun. Um, and all my years of schooling, I think it's happened like four times. So um, yeah, I think the, the first question, the loaded question was like, how are you doing? And that is extremely loaded, obviously. I think it's kind of a, an amalgamation of a lot of different emotions at this point of being really frustrated, being really sad, um, and also seeing twinges of hope. Um, and seeing the power of the collective has been really inspiring, I think. Seeing the ways, in some instances, not all, which is where some of the sadness and frustration comes from, that people are finally um, taking direction and, and like getting on board with some of these initiatives and finally taking direction from um, communities of color, specifically Black women, in my opinion. And so, yeah, there's a lot there and a lot more to unpack, but it's kind of like a frustration, some twinges of hope, a lot of sadness, and, and definitely looking towards the ways in which this moment has opened up all the other things that need to do. You know, one, one thread keeps being pulled and it's, it's revealing kind of the weaknesses of the web in general. So um, yeah, and then the second part was about ourselves, right? Um, very quickly, um, I am an alum of DU, and so I have an, a master's in international studies and then a master's in social work. Um, I am currently a licensed social worker in Colorado, and right after graduating, I worked uh, at SOS, actually, um, at Student Outreach and Support, so that was a great experience, and then I started working with um, torture survivors at the International Rescue Committee here in Denver, and then I'm currently um, an MHPSS, which is just Mental Health and Psychosocial Support and Protection Technical Advisor uh, in Bangladesh, in Cox Bazar, Bangladesh, working with Rohingya refugees. So there's a lot more there as well, but I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it continue. Thank you so much. Good to have you and good to have you um, in Colorado even for a little bit. So welcome, welcome back. Um, <laughs> so I think next, if I'm doing by names, first names is Daniel. Tell us a little bit about you. How are you, how are you generally doing? What is, what is going on for you? Where are you at? Hey everyone. So my name is Daniel Gonzalez. Uh, my middle name is Mason listed there. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. I don't know how to uh, edit my thing there. I'm super happy to be on the call today. Really, uh, really um, feeling grateful that I was invited. Um, I'm also a DU alum. I graduated in 2014 with a BA in International Studies, Concentration in Health and Development. And I'm currently a fourth year uh, medical student at Harvard, um, wrapping up my studies this, this last year. And, and honestly, you know, um, feeling really blessed and fortunate to be at an institution like Harvard. I never dreamed in a million years that I'd be at a school like that, or even that I would have, you know, gotten the, uh, the scholarship that I did to go to DU, um, but, you know, I feel like I've been blessed in that sense. Um, um, how I'm doing, I think, you know, it's been, 2020 has been quite the year, you know, um, string of events, pandemic, and then just, you know, um, I think, Ariel, you put it, you put it really well in terms of, of the web that, that is being exposed in, in our society and a lot of the issues that are just coming to the forefront. Um, I want to acknowledge that I feel, um, again, fortunate that had um, the privilege uh, with my family to to be in a place where you know we've been good economically, we've been kind of fine and stable, um, and I think just in terms of um, you know my solidarity with with the Black community and with with communities of color with everything that's been going on, I think obviously it's been I think anyone who has any sense of humanity has felt some pain in the last few weeks seeing what um, people have had to go through in our country. I think kind of the wounds that have been re reopened and re-exposed. Um, and so I think it's just been a lot of, you know, frustration, uh, reflection, and really, um, you know, 
I've, I've really been trying to think about my role, you know, in all of this and how, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, what our role is and there's people that try to tell you to stay in your lane, but, you know, I, I don't believe in that at all. Um, I, I swerve on the highway in that sense. And so I've um, been really trying to think about how myself in, in a very privileged, privileged position that I am, how can I contribute to some of the, the efforts that are going on, some of the work to, to make our country, our society, our world, a world a, a better place. Um, and so uh, I'll kind of leave it at that. I'm sure we'll kind of get more into it. Thanks, Daniel. It's really good to see you. Glad that you joined us today. And again, I'll keep dropping those bios in the chat. Um, oh, one thing too that I so guilty of doing, Daniel did this really well, actually. I just am very guilty of doing it is that I speak really fast. And so to help our amazing closed captioner outlets <laughs> across the collective, um, I'll remind myself to slow, slow way down. Um, so apologies to, to our amazing partner. So thank you. Thank you both so far for introducing yourselves. So if I'm, if I'm right in the alphabet, um, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly Schlobach, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, I also was thinking like ABC, I was, I had to do that as well. Um, so hi y'all, my name is Kelly Schlabach. Uh, I work as student outreach and support at University of Denver. I went to undergrad at Ohio University and got my master's in 2018 at University of Denver. And then uh, since then I've continued taking classes such as topics in qualitative research, studying race and the politics of research and praxis, critical whiteness studies I just finished. I'm also the co-chair for Whites Organizing for Racial Consciousness and um, doing a talk, I'm also a member of Queer University employees, so I'm doing a talk at the center, the center at Denver um, on unpacking LGBTQ plus white guilt. And so um, that's a little bit of what I am doing right now. And so personally, how I'm doing um, I would say that I also have a lot of anger and sadness and a feeling of, of, I don't know how to put this into a feeling yet, but just examination, just thinking about um, what my role is in terms of making sure I'm not educating and taking people who could be educated by, especially like Black queer women of color, and saying, oh, here, I'll educate you when I'm white and just examining and but at the same time taking responsibility so i think examining my role a lot especially as someone who has been really privileged in my racial identity as a white person but also my privilege in being educated at the master's level with courses that center race and whiteness um and just just navigating activism and racial justice as a marathon and not a sprint um, and making sure I'm just being really strategic, continuing to challenge myself and, and continuing to press on because I think there are a lot of folks too who uh, may be doing a lot of work now at um, the front and then potentially like tapering off as things go back to quote unquote normal. So, um, which is normal for white people obviously is not the same normal for black folks. So just um, a lot of examination too, along with anger and, and sadness, of course. Thank you for sharing more about that, Kelly, and all of the pieces, all of the pieces to that. Thanks. And then last but not least, our incredible, incredible Micaiah Jones. Um, I will turn it over to you to, to answer all parts of that that you're comfortable with. Yeah, hello, everyone. It's so nice to see so many familiar and brand new faces. Um, I am, oh, well, I'm Micaiah, pronouns she, hers. Um, so far as how I'm feeling, um, that is a loaded question, but I'm, I'm physically safe. And that's unfortunately a lot to ask for, but I'm feeling real blessed to have it. So we will take it and run with it. Um, overall, I think I have to echo Ariel's comment on the thread and just how much is really being pulled loose. And I think especially for Black women like myself, it's you know, you're seeing a lot of true colors, whether it be on social media and you hit that block button or in real life um, with a lot of the organizations we interact with on a daily basis, um, realizing that I no longer can be a member of my gym because they don't believe Black Lives Matter. So like, <laughs> um, it's, it's been a very active time. Um, there really isn't a place for rest right now. So for me, my focus has been how do I beyond acknowledging the fact that I'm tired, I'm tired of being tired, um, really 
honoring that and taking little moments as they come, um, which is kind of just how you get by the day by day, I feel like. Um, in my work, I'm really lucky to be employed also. Um, well, let me back up. I graduated from DU in 2019 with my bachelor's um, in gender and women's studies and public policy, which is incredibly applicable right now, <laughs> um, using all those intersections. And right now I work for Progressive Promotions as a digital engagement specialist. So specifically I do like social media, ad campaigns, email campaigns, um, and digital organizing on the behalf of progressive organizations. Um, my firm is woman owned, small business, super dope. They, they gave me Juneteenth off, which is amazing, though it should have already been a holiday. <laughs> um, and outside of my, you know, nine to five, I also have my own LLC doing policy analysis specifically for nonprofit groups and um, black and brown communities. Um, so yeah, trying to figure out what that means to be a business owner. This is brand new to us, <laughs> um, but it's, I'm okay. I'm doing well. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So y'all know uh, all of these folks who to hit up and for what purposes at what time. So check out their business. Makaya is oh, down there for me um, and, other <laughs> and other things that are happening. So um, thank you all so much for joining us and also for um, very much sharing honestly where, where you all are at and coming from and with, with all of the national um, pieces that we all know are not, especially us on this call and you all have named, is not recent, right? These are, these are long-term things that our country has been suppressing for a while. Um, it's really important that we're having these conversations and continuing them. So thank you all for making that time here today and sharing pieces from your, your experiences um, that we need to hear. So um, with that being said, you all know this, but I also just the name, like at no point do you have to reopen any wounds or feel like you have to share intimate parts of your life that you don't want to. Like just to put that out there, definitely don't do that if you don't want to, which knowing all of you, I, I very much know that you know that. So, um, but another quick question that I kind of have for you and from this, from here on out, um, we can go popcorn, step into that when you're ready slash want to answer. Um, the well, one question that I have is what communities, so it can either be kind of thinking about as you, um, as you were graduating or pieces like that, but I would, I'm interested to know what communities have you been involved with at DU or even after DU and how have those networks aided your navigation of racial justice um, then and now? So again, the question is, and we'll post it in the chat again. Also my copy and paste function isn't working. So in a second, I'm gonna put Micaiah's um, bio in there, but I don't know why it's not working. But anyway, we'll get it in there. But uh, that question again is, what communities have you been involved with at DU and after DU? And how have those networks aided your navigation of racial justice then and now? And so whoever is ready to step into that question, um, we'll do that. I'd be happy to start us off. Um, so I can, I can add a bit more to the, my response from the first question in, in responding to this. Uh, I forgot to mention that I'm also um, a Daniels Fund scholar. So for those who don't know, Daniels Fund is a, a private organization that um, offer, awards about 200 scholarships a year to um, low-income um, kind of students with potential in the uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico areas. Um, and so that's a community that I was part of at DU. Uh, during my time, DU was actually the university that had the most scholars out of any university in the country. Um, it is a, a supplemental scholarship for students who have the most need. It becomes a full ride scholarship um, to any school in the country. And so I, I feel really blessed to be part of that community. Um, and um, so I'm a first generation college student, I'm a second generation Mexican immigrant. And so that community was really important to me, just having um, you know, a group of people at a school like the University of Denver, which is a very, um, you know, prestigious and privileged institution that people like myself traditionally were not able to access. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I think DU has come a long way probably from, from where it was probably many years ago because my time there, I felt like I was able to find a community that supported me, um, even though I think the majority of the student population at DU, um, there, was, there was a bit of a barrier there, right, that, that I had some, some difficulty kind of relating um, but I think that's, that, that was the beauty of the experience is kind of getting to meet people from very different backgrounds. And so I, um, I worked at the Center for Multicultural Excellence um, 
Uh, I think the name's changed uh, since then and uh, things have been restructured. But um, during my time there, I worked as um, um, a coordinator, a student coordinator for access and pipelines of getting middle and high school students um, better access to higher education um, and on a lot of other projects. I was part of a lot of affinity-based groups, um, namely the Latino uh, Student Alliance. But you know, we had this really awesome one community of, of students from marginalized communities, from underrepresented identities that I felt that there's a really strong solidarity across the board with the black community, with um, you know, just different ethnic, racial, sexual identities. Um, and um, also part of groups like the undergraduate student government. And so I think, um, you know, being part of these groups, working with, you know, the Office of Center for Multicultural Excellence at an institutional level, working with student groups at a student level, um, I felt not only that sense of community, but, you know, it's, it's no secret, I think, to anyone on this call that BU has a fair share of problems, um, as, you know, really any college or just our country at large. Um, and so I felt that, you know, being part of these communities, being a member of this organization and, and working in the job that I did really helped me kind of um, work with others and, and learn how to think about approaching these issues, or, you know, kind of gaining, gaining the tools or, or learning how to even start those conversations, right? Like working across um, differences, groups that were super different, like Greek life, who, you know, um, I didn't join any Greek life when I was in college. So that was, that was um, um, a group that, that I wasn't as much a part of. Um, but getting back to the question of, of how, is it, how has it aided my, my navigation of racial justice then and now, I'd say that the big part, I think the, the huge kudos I would, I would throw out there is like the Center for Multicultural Excellence and the structure that we've been able to build up at DU over the years for teaching students about diversity, inclusive excellence, equity, um, just concepts of, of identity. I think um, even as like a first generation Latino student from a, a low income background, um, you know, it's just things we internalize. Um, over the years that maybe are, are probably not the best way to, to think of things and view the world. And, and we were able to create this space where we can kind of take a step back and think about our identities and our privileges. And even though, you know, I, I have some, some identities that are marginalized, owning my, my white passing privilege and my male privilege and, you know, all the, other, all the other privileges I carry with me, I think that's probably one of the things I value the most from, from not only participating in activities that CME hosted, but then working with them and, and thinking about not only how do I apply those things in my life, but then how can we bring other people into that conversation? How can we help others um, see past perhaps um, worldviews that have been entrenched throughout their entire lives from whatever background they come from and learn to, to reach across to others that are very different so that we can have um, productive and, and civil dialogue, which, which has become increasingly difficult, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, so, I'd say, you know, just that conglomerate of, of involvement in groups and, and in, in the offices um, really helps give me a sense of, of, you know, tools, approaches, strategies for, for creating that space and, and facilitating that dialogue that I've definitely used um, extensively at the medical school. Um, you know, it's also no secret that our healthcare system has a lot of issues and has a very messed up history, um, generally speaking, but specifically in regards to race. And so how can we um, take these tools and, and and bring them into other spaces that traditionally haven't been having these kinds of conversations. You know, you, you step into the medical realm and people, um, sorry, I feel like I'm still talking fast, so I'm gonna slow down because I see the words down here. Um, when we think of medicine, we think of basic science and innovation um, and cutting edge technology, but we also must be talking about um, how that translates into equitable care because what does it matter if we discover a new drug or some new technology if only some with money are gonna be able to benefit from it, or if only some with a certain skin color will be able to benefit from it. So I think that's really been the big takeaway for me and I've been involved in a ton of stuff, um, racial justice efforts um, at the school, currently still am. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, what I would say to that question. Thank you so much, Daniel. And um, I don't, for folks, uh, just some context, Daniel was a couple years older than me. And so very much someone on campus that I personally looked up to because of how much organizing he did. Um, and also is just a great dude all around. So <laughs> just wanna say that is um, someone that I very much still look up to. So, um, so excited you're on this call and thank you for sharing all parts of that and taking us, taking us there. So um, appreciate you. So I was able to type out the question in the chat, um, but for folks, um, step in when you're ready, what communities have you been involved with at and after DU and how um, have those networks aided your navigation of racial justice then and now? 
Yeah, I can hop in, contribute. Um, I also forgot that my thing was on mute for a little bit again. So <laughs> some communities that really um, honestly made DU, we're gonna call it tolerable um, because there were many a nights that we were like, we should just all leave. We should just all transfer. We'll stop paying them. It'll be great. No, um, I have to give a huge shout out to the Center for Multicultural Excellence, which is the only name I'll recognize it by, to be honest with you. Um, and specifically the Excelling Leaders Institute, Eli. I know some of my fam are on this call right now, <laughs> but Eli and specifically Tracy, Tracy Peters like saved me, we'll call it that. It was very much so um, provided me a foundation. Eli, for those who don't know, is a leadership program um, for I think about 20 to 30 students to show up to campus a week early. You have a week to get to know the resources, some of the people who are gonna be your best allies, um, some of your best friends. I'm still best friends with Bryce Armijo <laughs> and bother him all the time. Um, but really they provided um, the foundation to be able to find steady ground on a campus that did not care for black women. Um, and I truly do believe that. I think that the history of the university was not um, adequately acknowledged um, and reparations were not made um, as much as they should have been. So for Eli, for me, it was having that group of people to really make sure that like, you know, in the darkest of times when 2016 happened, November, um, checking in on each other and making sure that we were all right when some of us were harassed constantly on campus and some even physically assaulted because of who we looked like or who we loved, um, Eli was also that family to once again really wrap their arms around us. Um, and I really do appreciate that. And I wish Mama Tracy was still at DU, but I'm happy for her in California. Other communities that I participated in, I think student alliances like Daniel was talking about are incredibly important. And honestly, we were all a part of every student alliance, <laughs> to be honest with you, it was truly, um, black and brown folks, queer folks, people who just cared about other people having a nice life, we all came together. Um, though we did have our homes within our alliances, we always supported each other, showed up to each other's events as much as possible, and really continued to hook each other up with resources all the time. Um, if your budget wasn't looking right this year, how can VSA help you out and help sponsor this speaker that's about to come? How can we rely on each other? Um, BSA, I did join a multicultural sorority, Theta Nu Xi, Multicultural Sorority Incorporated. Um, that was also a huge part of my foundation. Very proud of that too. Um, and then one that we kind of just made up because of the need for organization on campus was the DU student activists. We called ourselves DUSA and we used like the Avengers A as our symbol when we were going around campus. Um, but so far as um, once again supporting and also helping to sharpen um, my racial justice skills, we'll call them. DUSA was the conglomerate of the same five students that y'all saw at every rally um, coming together to organize the blackout, to <laughs> demand um, justice for our indigenous students on campus. It was those folks who were from all sorts of alliances, people who were unaffiliated, student athletes who showed up. Um, I think there were you know, staff members who really cared too. Kelly was one of them who showed up all the time. Thank you, girl. Um, and we really all just bonded in this unnamed group and we just gave ourselves a name so that we felt that we had this home, this place to come together. Um, and I continue to rely on my DUSA, BSA, TNX, Eli family in still holding the university accountable because DU has not been silent in messing up um, since I've graduated, which was only a year ago like literally a year ago. <laughs> so um, it's been awesome to have those people, those students, faculty, staff, alum, to really come together and um, be that shoulder to cry on, but also be the person to call you out when you're being silent. We see a lot of people getting called out for being silent on social media, but are you showing up how you can in the time of COVID to support your black and brown um, brothers and sisters also? Um, so it's been a great way to call people in. Ariel and I got together several times when things popped off two weeks ago. Um, but yeah, so um, everybody <laughs> was my community, um, or at least a lot of people who were just really um, invested in making DU more equitable. 
Thank you, Micaiah. Thank you. I think I'll jump in next if that's good. Um, thank you, Micaiah. Um, I think it's, I love hearing, I'm actually so glad that people who went through the undergrad experience at DU went first, because I think that the undergrad experience and the graduate experience, I went to undergrad um, right outside of Chicago, which is, you know, near where I'm from, and it was a totally different way of navigating. So, you know, the University of Denver is not it is not welcoming and um, to non-white persons, right? But then when you add the layer of graduate students, it feels like at some point, at, at different periods, it felt like at some point somebody was like, oh, we should really have grad schools here and just figure it out. And then the students, you know, the students of color, particularly who are graduate students, were kind of like, we we're all kind of bumbling around in the dark, um, but understanding how, how many resources we needed. And so places like CME, which were huge lifelines, but then the community that I was able to cultivate, it was very much, almost, it was almost not, it was unaffiliated. I wasn't a part of any alliance necessary, necessarily. They were very, um, I would show up for the blackout and I would show up to support the things that the undergraduates had spearheaded in a lot of ways. But until I found a space within Corbell um, with amazing people like Abigail to, to, to voice and put structures around the things that we were seeing as issues and then move to organize things to address those. Before that, it was a lot of like, it was a lot of stress. It was a lot of confusion. Should I have even been here? Um, what did I get myself into? Um, you know, I think everybody can resonate with getting duped by the, <laughs> duped by the pamphlets and the, and the website and, you know, all of those things that you thought you were getting into that you realized you weren't. And as a graduate student, they really expect you, whether you're from an underrepresented community or whether you're, you know, from a, you're a first generation person. Um, I mean, technically in my family, I am the first generation in undergrad and I am officially the first person in my family to have a master's degree. So we have no idea what we're doing. And it wasn't something you can like call home and be like, hey, what do I do? They're like, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, and at DU, you really had, to, I found to create community, it, it meant doing a ton of extra work then to identify allies, to identify um, peers and friends, um, which I was able to do eventually. But so I think that is something else that's really important because particularly our, our graduate students of color are struggling in a, in a really um, often, and it's, I've graduated Oh, two years now. Um, so I'm hoping some things have changed a little bit. But when I was there, it was it was people were just struggling and they didn't even know what to do. They didn't know where to go. They didn't know what resources to to launch into until you found a place like CME, until you find your allies in your um, in your program. But even that, building coalition was really hard um, for understandingly, right? And I think that we. Some of the best things that I, communities that I was able to form were at Corbell, but they were also through classes and, and it was helping to understand. Um, I was at GSSW and I was at Corbell. And so both of those come with their own set of challenges in terms of, of working against some very deeply embedded systems of oppression there, but also just the way that we're presenting ourselves and, and the way that peers engage with the content. Um, and just being tired, I think at the end of the day, uh, I did a lot of work when I was in grad school outside of my, my academic work to support initiatives, to spearhead them, and to really kind of show up consistently. And it became, it wasn't just because I believed in it, it was, it was a release, it was a community because the people that I knew were gonna be at those events, the people that I knew were gonna participate were the people who had my back ultimately, if anything, you know, happened whenever I experienced any sort of, um, of issues with the administration. And I had a moment when, when I was listening to you all talk is like kind of um, full disclosure. As soon as I graduated from DU, I had after I after I um, got a different job after SOS, um, I had to take a step back. And I don't think that I acknowledged anything that happened on DU's campus until recently, because it was a moment of realizing how much unlearning I had to do and how much space I actually had to take to be be a, like a complete functioning human again. Like I needed to start getting more than four hours of sleep every night. I needed to do some of these things that are really basic, but the way in which that the university expected uh, students, particularly students of color, particularly women, some women of color um, to do the work that they weren't doing meant that it wasn't only necessary for your academic survival, but for your, your sense of well-being and sense of, 
of safety. Um, I know Makaya mentions, you know, students getting assaulted. And when you hear about those things and you realize your own vulnerability, but the vulnerability of the people next to you, it is a responsibility as a non-Black POC, right? And as a person who, you know, depending on who you're talking to, like people just think I'm tan or people think, you know, it's, you have a responsibility with the body that you're in to show up for the people who can't always do so safely. And the university knew that and they just let you keep doing it without any sort of commitment. And there's an expectation that you will do it. Um, you know, the, I have all these funds, could you help me figure out what to do with them? Or we have this problem, we really want it to be a student-led grass, grassroots bottom, bottom up approach, but all that really means is that we want you to do all the labor and um, we want you to make some solutions that we may or may not be able to get past by our predominantly white board because it doesn't appeal to them financially or appeal to their values. Um, so all of that is to be said, a lot of what I learned and the ability to advocate for myself and to kind of crystallize around my beliefs and the way that I see a system and, and the endemic weaknesses and racism within it was in spite of what I saw or because of what I saw and in spite of trying to, or having any faith in the, the system to correct itself. Um, so yeah, you, I think I can leave it there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go to Kelly to share a little bit of um, your thoughts on the question, and then we'll um, skip to our last question for the day before we go into Q&A. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, so my thought, too, as I heard the other wonderful panelists speak, and also as I was looking for through my notes, is to talk a little bit, of course, about, um, I think, why I'm still involved in the communities I am in, because it's very intentional. And then also, of course, like how they're supportive of um, my navigation of racial justice. So mainly the communities that I formed at DU um, and are still critical to navigation of social justice and racial justice specifically at DU and after graduation is work with a K. Um, my work family is very important to me. Um, my cohort, especially folks in my cohort who took race theory and especially those who, those of us Together. and then um, work with the C, which is the Whites Organizing for Racial Consciousness. Um, so I think my closest community, I'm a white woman from the Midwest, so I think there's a lot of pressure in the Midwest, especially, and of course, for white people to stay silent and also keep the peace. And I think community building and why I am still connected with those specific communities is because I think that my closest communities are not the people who like kept the peace with me. Um, they are the people who called me out. They are the people who had, I had really tough conversations with. And I think the critical conversations and being open to being held accountable and also holding other people accountable makes for stronger communities because then we know how to show up for each other. We know how to build the space so people, especially Black, Indigenous people of color, can show up authentically and as their holistic self. And then we also... Um, are able to know that we can still show up for each other and trust each other that we will continue to show up. So for me, I think um, in regards to racial justice, there, there are a couple ways it's shown up for me. Um, in one way, there was, I think, me and one other white person who took critical race theory together. And with work, with the C, um, I now have white folks who are more critical or where I can take all my white feelings because it shouldn't be on black indigenous people of color to hold space for my feelings and my like, I messed up to be, I messed up today. And like my, I'm learning these things or these other things and it's interacting with my queer identity or it's interacting with these other parts and I need help untangling that. I have white folks that I can go to and I think that's really important. And they can also more importantly, they're not there to comfort me. They know how to hold the space for me and while I process and strategize how to move forward. So if I mess up and I say I harm someone, they're not there saying, oh, it's okay, because it's not okay. And so they're helping me process and hold space and strategize on how to move forward. Um, I think in the, the last couple, I'm also now just blessed and I cannot thank the people who have called me out enough, some of which are in this panel and on this, in this audience and attendees, um, I'm so blessed with people who call me out and hold me accountable because that's really integral. And to me, that shows that they are invested in me and they believe in me and they also love their communities and have love for me and know I can do better. And so 
I'm white and that veil of white supremacy and white ignorance is thick. And so I always appreciate when people call me out and that's really important to have that openness to where you people, especially black and indigenous people of color know they can call you out and that you're gonna take it to heart. You're gonna change your actions and then you are going to make change specifically. And then um, I think another thing with that is that um, that veil is so thick that I always know I'm going to fall back into it. I always know it's going to be my default. And so it's a consistent unlearning. It's not just like, oh, I read the book, check. Um, and so the last thing I would say is I also have folks who are embedded in racial justice work. So I have a community to strategize with. White supremacy is meant to isolate people. And so that's why it's so important to have that community. And so even last night, I was chatting with someone from my cohort and we created an action oriented book circle and talking about that specifically with our friends and family to keep the conversations going beyond when the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Nina Pop, don't forget those, the black trans folks, um, Tony McDade, Elijah McLean, and so many others are strategically silenced. Having that com critical community of people is really important for accountability and trustworthy, making sure I'm going forward and then making sure we're holding each other accountable so that we move forward too. Yes, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> and thank you for all folks. Like this has been really, really powerful to be a part of. And I think I was even taking notes across the board with all of you, because I think everyone to some capacity was hitting on some really critical points. Some of those being what is, what is it like to hold each other accountable, making space for stronger communities is one piece that we heard and to build trust and to show up, right? Knowing that trust is something that's built. It's not just immediately given a lot of times, especially for marginalized communities. Um, but I also heard a lot of themes around what does it mean to actually feel belonging and to know that you belong um, in a space that otherwise is telling you no, right? And that can be larger systemic things telling you you don't belong here. Like, what is your physical body doing on this campus? And just the power of what does it mean to actually see belonging as a process and not as something that's an end goal, knowing that it's in the everyday actions, right? It's the activeness of getting to belonging. It's the activeness of showing up to these meetings. It's the activeness of feeling supported in these times when incidents happen on campus as they have and will probably continue to do, right? It's the what do we do as actions to see and to feel belonging, um, and ultimately how to show up for each other. So I hear that kind of across all these stories is what does it mean to actually, to pay attention to these larger issues, these large systemic issues, and not just see them as interpersonal problems because they're not just interpersonal, right? Like that hurts, that will always hurt, but these larger systems is something that we as an institution need to be addressing. Um, so thank you all so much for that. Um, Looking at time, I think I'm going to quickly just hit on um, some, I want to ask you all to kind of like quickly list out some pieces, but also share some tangible recommendations for this last piece, uh, and then we'll open it up to some of the questions that we've gotten, which is, the last one is, given your experiences and all that you've shared today, uh, how can we continue to show up to support communities as alum uh, to fight interpersonal and institutional racism? So, if that's tangibles, recommendations, anything that kind of pops to mind, um, let's get kind of a good bank of things going. And you can jump in when you're ready. I'll jump in. Oh, Kelly, do you want to go? Well, we'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> the really quick, small, um, not, they're not small things, but the quick things is, is I think something you keep saying that, which is so, so important, is actually showing up and building trust like Kelly mentioned, because when I, I wasn't supposed to be in the US right now and, and I am because of COVID. And it was a really good testament to be able to text people in my community and be like, all right, I'm here. What do you need? How can I support? What can I do? And then you jump in and you show up. So you don't just text and be like, oh, I'm here. Like, let's get coffee. Like, let's get coffee and strategize. Let's get, let's get coffee. Let me hold space for you. And then let's get something done. Um, so that comes with, with consistently, consistently showing up. Um, the other thing is holding DU accountable. What I um, have learned in, and what I've been doing is anytime they call me for donations or literally anything, unless it's something like this, um, I'm very clear that I will not be supporting them. I'm not giving you any more of my funds. I am not recommending that anybody comes to this institution until I see commitments to change. And every time that they call and every time somebody asks me for feedback, that is the answer that they get politely because I know it's the students calling and it's not, you know, it's, it's just that it's their job. Um, but the idea being that we see what you're doing and what you're not doing and we're going to continue to take you to task for it. 
um, there's been a huge drain of like melanated brilliance out of this university. And if that continues to happen, there's a reason. People are leaving because they are unsafe, they are un, unappreciated and uncompensated for the effort that they do. And as an alum, I'm not gonna give you funds or give you recommendations of students to give you more funds if you can't keep that in house, if you can't do better. Um, and so those are some very quick things and, and being really clear about that. Go ahead and offer a little bit. So for me, there's one overarching theme and then specific tangibles and I'll go quick. But the overarching theme is that I've seen on social media that people are like, oh, if you don't want to like protest, the movement needs different people in all lanes. But I, I think that's silly. I think we need all people in all lanes. And of course, we need people to show up at protests. But I think if people are unless, you know, with COVID, that's a different scenario. I'm not going to judge your health. Um, but we need all people in all lanes. To me, that shows up systemic, interpersonal, and self is kind of the, the buckets that I think of. Um, so in terms of those three, systemic, like show up to town halls at DU, uh, campus organizing to push for racial justice. Like Ariel said, use your alumni voice and support student demands. Black Students Alliance has put out demands. I don't even think the original ones for like 2016 have been all been met. So um, show up and then use your alumni voice, give money, See how you can give money to affinity groups like Black Student Alliance on campus and student organizations. Like, even if you just message someone to see me, I don't want to put more work on them. But if you're just like, I just want to buy food for joint council. I want to buy food. I want to contribute to the care of the students and the student activists. I think that's really important. Um, interpersonal, hold your fellow staff members and your fellow alumni accountable. We've talked about that. Um, center the vo student voices you're hearing of Black, Indigenous students of color. Check in on students you know who are student activists and see how they're doing. Again, say, can I buy you a meal? Can I buy you a coffee? Um, like, can I feed you? Um, and hold that accountable. We know that alumni have a lot of sway here, and the sway typically has, has been to keep, like, racist uh, mascots. So use your alumni voice to sway it the other way. Um, and then self. So do the work so you're not as much as possible contributing to the white supremacy and racism that our students are protesting against and are speaking against. Um, and employees of color are fighting against because we know it's not just staff and faculty, there are other employees of color do you as well. Um, and so also, you so that's go to trainings, read or do Me and White Supremacy by Layla Saad and actually do it, like do the workbook, not just read. So um, I know that I went really fast, I'm sorry. Um, but for, again, that's the systemic, the interpersonal, the self, and that's all of them. If you're like, I'm just gonna read for now, know that you need to be doing all three at once, especially like white folks. This is, this is the time. The time was like 400 years ago, but it is, it is still the time. So um, just making sure you're doing at least something in all of these areas and not just saying I'm most comfortable in this one. Thank you. Makaya, Daniel, anything quick before we jump to some questions that we got from the audience? Yeah, I'd love to just add quickly that um, I agree with, with everything that was just said. I just want to acknowledge, you know, um, I don't know many of the names in the audience, but, you know, I want to be frank in saying that these issues are complex and, and you know, um, I think I want to just take a step back and, and have everybody think about everyone that, that's listening on this call, you know, I hope this isn't coming across and, and I mean, it'll come across as it'll come across, but, you know, we're not just here knocking to you saying like, oh, this and this sucks. Um, I think sometimes the message gets lost a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I've recently been been working on some some racial justice issues with a, with a specific organization that I won't name, but, you um, you know, I just want to say that in the same way that we think of like, like um, patriotism and how convoluted that is these days, but, but that it should mean wanting your country to be the best version of itself. I think what's coming out of this conversation and the comments that are being made, as difficult as they may be to hear, and as much as maybe some people might agree or disagree, I think hopefully we can all agree that we all want EU to be the best version of itself and that it can be as welcoming um, and as representative of, of the communities that, that surround EU. I'm not trying to be political here, but like, I think we just need to be frank that, you know, um, there's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of division on our campus and probably on people on, on this call. And so, um, you know, I hope that, that people listening can kind of hear these experiences that students of color are sharing with you about um, pain, pain that they felt personally that, that I, you know, um, have felt in, in my own ways. 
during my experience navigating the University of Denver. Um, and yeah, it'll never be a perfect experience for anybody. College is a time of, of growth and, and difficulty and challenge. But what we're hearing consistently in society and at our school, of course, um, is that it is disproportionately difficult and painful for people of color and people who are marginalized. So, um, you know, I want us to just all challenge ourselves to take a step back and ask ourselves, what are we doing? What can we do to combat that reality, to improve it? Uh, because it shouldn't be that way. You know, it shouldn't be the case that a black student at DU has to work three times as hard to feel welcome, to find community, to find someone that they feel um, personally connected to because of issues around compositional diversity, because of issues around, um, and I'll slow down again, because I know I get, I get really fast. Whoever's typing and doing closed captioning is like, they got like, like amazing fingers and just um, kudos to you. Um, but you know, issues around faculty diversity, issues around um, financial aid and just, and just affording housing and, and feeling a part of the community, being able to afford being in traditional or multicultural Greek life, just so many issues, right? Um, and so I just wanted to, to kind of acknowledge that and put that out there. Um, you know, I don't know if I have much to add beyond what's already been said in terms of actionable and tangible steps. Um, I think, you know, it was mentioned that the Black Student Alliance has already put out a list of demands that maybe we should all look into, but, but really I just want to challenge us all to, to think about how we can um, try to overcome that division that exists and just um, try to hear um, the voices of people that have felt um, oppressed and marginalized on the DU campus. I'll be so brief. I will, I will. Um, yes, make DU better, absolutely. I will bag on DU. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna challenge and be that person today because I think DU is terrible. As an institution, not necessarily all the people, though a lot of the people there were very complicit in the direct physical, emotional, mental harm of black and brown and queer ex like identity students, right? Um, so do care for the people of DU. Um, Send a black woman some money. That's gonna be a tangible thing for you to do. Somebody paid for my dinner the other night and I literally cried, it was beautiful. <laughs> and um, I think truly my only point because y'all have really caught it all is um, something that I've really had to tap into is black queer women are not gonna save your precious soul. Um, do not put that work on them. Don't text, call, FaceTime your one black friend, your one queer friend, your one indigenous friend and think that they are going to do something for you because we are literally, this is survival mode. So my survival is not going to be your education. You got to do that yourself and recognize the privileges that you have um, and own up to it. And you're going to get it wrong several times. And that's okay. Um, just try to minimize your harm and apologize when we do hurt other folks. So feel free to Venmo me. I'm kidding. You can if you want. But yeah, that'll be my tangible, <laughs> my tangibles for y'all. Read a book, um, watch a documentary. Thank you, Makaya. And yes, take her out to dinner. Heck yeah. It's all folks. <laughs> um, but not, not to make light of that, like truly, thank you all so much for for these statements and also just for the very real emotions and that lived pieces is even in your voices, I can hear that. And um, yeah, I think there is something to say about what does it mean to, to be in survival mode versus thriving mode? And um, one, one quote that I'll kind of end up on and then I'll hand it back to Anne is um, one about resilience that I was sent and I keep sharing and I don't know who wrote it, which is unfortunate because it's a graphic with no author. So I'm gonna find that, but essentially it says resilience is all about being able to overcome the unexpected. Sustainability is about survival. The goal of resilience is to thrive, right? And I said this before and I'll keep saying it again, but it is not a place for DU to just allow our students, especially marginalized students to just survive DU. Like that's really sad. It needs, we need to, tangible things to make sure that students are thriving at this university and not just surviving it. Um, and I hear that even in my classroom, that students are just trying to get, just trying to get their degree and move on. And that's, that's sad. So I think it's the what can we do to really step up and knowing that it is not just um, it's not just a want, but it's also a very much a need if we're gonna if this university is gonna continue. So um, cheers to all the folks who've been chatting with us in the chat. 
Um, we only got one question, but we'll follow up uh, with you uh, separately. And then from there, I'm going to um, turn over to Anne. The last thing that I'll just say is that this, uh, this larger series, again, is part of the Communities Plus Values, and Anne will talk more about that in a second. Um, but just want to name that uh, this is one of many conversations that they've continued to have and will continue to have. So um, Communities Plus Values is all about um, guiding the work that needs to happen based on the values that we say that we believe in. And so they're working to build that at DU. So um, with that being said, uh, it is the spring, springboard for action. So I'll turn it back over to Anne. Uh, and just want to say thank you to all of our panelists and thank you for allowing me to be in this space as well. Um, I really care a lot for you all. So thank you. Cheers. Nana, you are um, something else. This, uh, um, I'm privileged just to sit and listen and I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, one of the things that I've heard time and time again, we, we just graduated um, 11, uh, our, our first class of Colorado Women's College Scholars. And they are 11 women who are um, either first generation or from marginalized communities. And their, their, their experience, I mean, I hear, I hear echoes of it, right? And this is a class that just graduated and you all graduated a few years ago. So it gives me good perspective on um, the change that hasn't happened that we're still working on. And, uh, and one of the things that I always hear is the surprise the surprise of coming to an institution like DU and, and ex having one expectation and having a very different experience. And, uh, and so I, I wanna just say thank you to all of you because I think that to, um, to hang in there so that we can, as Daniel said, make DU the best version of itself um, is, is the most that we could possibly ask from any of our alums under any circumstances, but certainly um, for those of you who, and all of you who've been here and have felt pain and fatigue, um, and who felt confusion and frustration and anger. Um, but you've carved out a space uh, uh, for DU in your hearts, I can hear it. And, I, and you've also carved out a heart space at DU. So if we could take some of these, I was thinking at the beginning when you were all talking about your small communities and the ways that you found places. And I think maybe part of our job is to figure out how to weave all of those places together so that the, the full entity starts to provide that kind of support. Um, I think it would be, uh, uh, incredibly beautiful and I give you my commitment um, as one of many leaders at DU that I'm, I'm going to just keep listening. I'm also hearing and I think it's important to say we do this in C plus D and I'm so grateful to our three graduate students um, and our project manager Chase and, and you all have created, they really, and I'm going to speak to them, they, you have created this space which is hugely important, right? Because it gives different, um, different people voice and agency and what I want to commit to is uh, we want to continue that voice and agency, but I don't think it's it's our job to delegate responsibility, right? Um, I think that that's what I hear is that the university and the institution has to take the responsibility. We invite other people into the conversation and give agency so that where there is courage and where there is um, commitment and, and energy and not fatigue, that you all can do the things that you want to do as students um, and as alums. So I think that's very important. I want to end on two really good notes. One is that while we were on this call, um, a note came out from the chancellor and I was kind of hoping that it was going to come out during this call so that I could share the news with you all. But tomorrow, June 19th, Juneteenth, um, is going to be an official vacation, paid vacation day at the University of Denver. So um, we are, and he's setting it up as a, a day of reflection, um, provides a bunch of resources for folks to, um, to take a look at that uh, and look at what they can do and what they want to do. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm encouraged. I, I think that uh, he's, the letter looks good. I haven't had a chance to read it because I've been listening to you all, but I knew that that, um, that decision was made yesterday. And so um, I'm just glad to see that come through. Uh, you're right, Nikia, it should be a national holiday, right? Um, I think. I guess. So um, that is, that's really great. The other piece is that next week, um, I hope that you'll be able to join us. We have another alum now. Her name is Dr. Tracy Kazee. She is the head, she's the retired um, head of the diversity, equity, and inclusion at the NYPD. Um, she did Anne freeze for y'all. Yeah. As we're getting Anne back, just want to shout out Abigail really quick. Truly, truly incredible um, for everything that you've done and continue to do for all of us at DU. So 
um, Abigail's on this call with us and has always been on the back end, on the front end, on everything for the university over her time at DU. Um, and just want to say, I see the hurt and I see the pain and I know you will continue to thrive, my friend. And I'm so happy that you are, that you're in a place to, to do some incredible things post DU. So, um, just filling that until Anne. Oh, Anne, are you back? Anne's back. Okay. Tag Anne, but I feel like you're the rock. And I don't know where I dropped off. Did you hear about Tracy for next week? Not, 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 not. You were starting about Tracy. I, I got you up until NYPD, diversity okay. and inclusion, which is so quite she's a, a, quite she's a, a new role. alum and she's the, um, the former head of the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion at the NYPD. And she has uh, um, become just a terrific mentor and friend of mine. She's on my advisory board and she'll join us next week um, for a talk here about um, policing equity and, uh, and how community plays a role in that. So, uh, I mean, like right at the heart um, of what's going on. And, and so what we wanna do is continue to bring you opportunities to participate in really relevant conversations um, to give places to bring your hearts and your minds to DU. Um, so I just wanna end with huge, huge um, gratitude for all of you. Uh, and I hope I get a chance to meet all of you at some point. If you're back by the campus, um, please reach out. And actually, I think I'm gonna reach out. I'm gonna get Abby to give me all of your emails because I wanna get to know you a little better. So um, thanks. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you um, same time, same place next week. <laughs>